Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Neil Harrington, who is um, an environmental bi biologist with the tribe. He's been with the tribe for nine years. And I'm going to let Neil take, uh, take it away here and introduce himself some, some, some more. Hi, everyone. I'm Neil Harrington. Uh, I'm an environmental biologist at the Jamestown Skullin tribe. Uh, I think uh, Bonnie kind of asked me to kind of give a little bit of my background. So I am um, originally from Northern California. I studied marine biology and oceanography at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, one of the places I did studies is actually on nutrient cycling, but um, one of the places was Elkhorn Slough on the central coast of California. And I remember seeing Olympia oysters in Elkhorn Slough and going, huh, there's a little, there's a little oysters on these pilings. Um, little did I know I'd be working to restore those uh, different populations about 800 miles north, 20 years later. Um, and since moving to Washington in 2000, I've actually worked with fish and wildlife doing uh, shellfish surveys, worked in water quality for Jefferson County, water quality manager for several years. Um, I also was a shellfish biologist for the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe pre prior to coming to Jamestown in 2012. Um, I'm gonna, gonna launch into my presentation now. I'm gonna ask that questions either be put into the chat or saved for the end. Um, I think with Zoom, it's just gonna be a lot easier to, um, to not have those interruptions. Um, let's see here. Um, and I, before I start, I really wanna also state that um, most of these pictures are from myself or from my colleagues at Jamestown. And I think I cited any photos that weren't ours. Some of the other ones I grabbed were from Puget Sound Restoration Fund. Um, and I want to thank Monica Montgomery, who actually uh, made some of these slides for a different presentation. And then Annie Raymond, um, our shellfish biologist who worked up some of the data or a lot of the data that I show about Swim Bay. And uh, David Brownell, I borrowed some of his slides to talk about the history of the Olympia oyster. In, uh, James, or in uh, Glenn. So quick outline of today's talk, which is the rise and fall and rise again of the Olympia oyster. I'm not gonna go to much, so much into the, the initial rise, but I'm just gonna say it's very, it was a very important organism. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the fall and then how we're, uh, how we have this rise again of the Olympia oyster. So first off, um, I'll talk a bit about what is an Olympia oyster? Um, the history of the Olympia, um, F restoration efforts in Squim and Discovery Bay, um, some of the re uh, results of the restoration, and, and sort of what does the future hold, and uh, where do we go from here a little bit. And that'll somewhat be sprinkled in among the, the talk as well. So what, what is an Olympia oyster? Well, it's a bivalve mollusk. So it's related to snails and slugs and, uh, and more closely related to things like clams and mussels. So it has two valves or shells that close and enclose its body. Um, it lives on the surface or maybe just slightly underneath other oysters, for example. Sometimes you'll find them living in gravel even. Um, but but it, they, don't, they don't get buried. You know, they're not like a clam where you have to dig them out. Um, they are, uh, you know, so they're, they're a surface dweller and they're not like a muscle where they attach to, well, they do attach to rocks. Um, they like to attach to hard substrate so um, although you'll sometimes find a singular oyster, say resting on mud, at some point when that was a baby, when it was a planktonic larva, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the general life cycle here in a moment, it will settle out on something hard. So um, they range from Baja to Alaska. Um, it's our only native oyster. So we actually have a couple other species of oyster in the Puget Sound. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, primarily the Pacific oyster. They're fairly small. They rarely top out more than two and a half inches. That, that picture down there at the lower left um, is a variety of sizes of Olympia oyster from a beach on Maristone Island. And, and that, that lower one is, is, you know, sometimes you'll find them bigger than that, but not too often. Historically, there were thousands of acres in Puget Sound estimated like 9,000 acres of, of Olympia oysters. Some in these dense natural beds or reef structures we see here on that lower right in Nootka Sound up on Vancouver Island. 
Um, and these were really important habitats. If you think about these, these were often at sort of the heads of the bay, you know, places like South Swim Bay or Discovery Bay or, or the, like the south end of Hood Canal near Belfair, where you had these large aggregations of, of Olympia oysters that formed these beds. These are, these are biogenic habitats. So as these oysters reproduced, young oysters were settling on the old oysters. So they were creating habitat for their young um, habitat for a lot of other organisms. If you think about this and you contrast this with a mud flat, which has its own uh, its own ecology, but you contrast that with this, this is a this is a complex three dimensional habitat. So you think about things like copepods and isopods and lots of little crustaceans living in and among these these oysters. Um, good foraging habitat for salmon, for example, to come down and pick off some of these crustaceans that live on these on these beds. Um, so they're, they're a biogenic species, you know, they're a reef forming species or bed forming species. Um, they improve water quality. So they have a large filtration capacity. They're filter feeders. So as they, um, as they feed, they're, they're filtering water through, um, their mantle cavity and picking out, uh, plankton. Um, and so, uh, and then, so that, that improves nutrient cycling in the estuary. Also within that boundary layer between oysters and the sediment, um, denitrification can occur. So these can be kind of mitigate nutrient inputs into an estuary as well. Um, they have an interesting life uh, cycle. They're hermaphrodites. So um, they'll alternate between being male essentially and female. They have both, both sets of organs. Um, they typically have one more developed than the other. They release these um, sperm uh, capsules or sperm balls that go out and then are um, hopefully uh, taken into a female's um, mantle cavity where the, it'll fertilize the, her eggs. And then those villagers, uh, or excuse me, those larvae are developed into little villagers over seven to 12 days. So the female Olympia uh, actually broods its young for a week or two and then releases its larva for a week to 60 days. And those little larvae are up there at the top there of that. Um, they're like little, they kind of look like little teeny swimming clams. And they, um, once they're mature enough, they'll start looking for someplace hard to settle down. So ideal Olympia, oyster, you know, ideal is another oyster shell. Um, often on the underside um, or a rock, or um, sometimes I've seen them settled on wood. Um, I saw them settled on old cable in Discovery Bay left over from a mill. So something hard, but what they can't do is settle on mud. Um, they need a piece of shell. They need something substantial um, to, to settle on. Let's see here. So I just wanna contrast the Olympia with the Pacific. Pacifics are native to Japan. Um, they grow much bigger. I mean, I think that's the first thing if you see an oyster the size of a shoe, it's a Pacific. Um, there's actually a couple other uh, introduced species, but Pacifics are the ones you're going to see. Um, almost all commercial oysters in the state of Washington are Pacific. So um, they, uh, they grow faster um, and they have more meat on them. Um, the, the recreational size limit of 2.5 inches was set to protect Olympias because Olympias hardly ever get any bigger than that. Um, Olympias also have this interesting habitat sometimes, or habit, uh, growth habit. You can see that in the center picture where I, I found a rock with both, both a Pacific on the, on the right-hand side and Olympia on the left. The Olympia tends to hang out kind of like a shingle, whereas a Pacific will kind of conform to whatever it's settled on as well. So, um, so that's, a, that's a giveaway. There, there's, there's a couple of others. but um, And then on the right there, you see a rock with both a Pacific and an Olympia settled on it. Um, these species will co-occur. Um, Olympias tend to um, tend to favor more habitats. We'll say wet at low tide. The Olympias are, are not as hot and cold tolerant, so you do not find them as high on the inner tidal. Um, we often find them in outlets to lagoons or areas of the beach that have seeping water on them. Uh, sometimes you find them like down in Daybob, we did a survey where once you dug down through this pretty dense Pacific reef, there were Olympia oysters underneath it. 
where they could stay shady and cooler than the Pacifics that could kind of handle the heat up above. Um, as I mentioned previous, they, they're, they're brood spawners, um, whereas Pacifics are, are broadcast spawners. If you're lucky in August and Hood Canal is warm enough, you might see the oysters spawning where the water is milky. Um, but um, um, the other thing too is Olympias spawn at lower temperatures. So we see them successfully spawn almost every single year in Discovery and Swim Bays, which don't get particularly warm. But um, it's pretty rare to get Pacific oysters spawning in those bays because it just doesn't get warm enough for long enough. Um, some years that are really warm, like uh, 2015, which is the blob year, and, and Squim Bay was very warm. We had a very large Pacific oyster set, but, but most years we don't see much Pacific reproduction in, in Northern Puget Sound. Um, Hood Canal, South Sound, some of those areas often see that because their water, the surface water gets warm enough. Um, importance to tribes. Um, you know, these, these organisms, these, these creatures were eaten since time immemorial. Um, really important food stuff. Winter village sites, which, which uh, were often situated near Olympia oyster beds. And, um, you know, I think about it and, and, and if you're, you know, if you're trying to, um, you know, it's, it's a protein source that doesn't require digging or catching, it, it's there. And there's evidence that these beds were maintained and taken care of so that they continued to produce Olympia oysters, um, continue to produce oysters. Um, for a couple of reasons, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, Olympias were poorly represented in archeological deposits. Um, um, I just wanna address the map on the right there, the upper left-hand side, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah, I see it. So this, this is Washington Harbor, um, the, uh, the village that, that is now at Washington Harbor, or was at Washington Harbor, kind of near where Battelle is located now. There's an Olympia oyster uh, bed in Washington Harbor, um, which is, is a target for future restoration. Um, also down in Discovery Bay, there was a village site here as well. Um, and that's close to our Discovery Bay site um, for the Jefferson MRC. And then here at Blinn is the site I'm gonna to talk to next. This is probably more of a seasonal, um, seasonal site. Um, and, um, but uh, as we see, we see, um, you know, probably extensive Olympia oyster beds here that were harvested um, when, um, probably likely when they came down to, to uh, uh, fish the fish trap at Jimmy Come Lately Tr Creek in the fall. Um, so, uh, David Brownell, who's on here, could go into far more detail about this, but I borrowed some of his slides because um, there's an excavation as they were building uh, the Veterans Memorial Park adjacent to the Jamestown government campus there at the south end of Swim Bay, um, referred to as the picnic site. Um, and this excavation was, they were re, re, uh, sort of re, un, I mean, what, how did best describe it? They were, they were, putting a creek back in its channel, essentially, or re-channelizing a creek. And they, um, although there was an archeological assessment done, they missed this area down near the, the beach. And so work was, was paused um, while they um, did this archeological excavation. Um, Neil, I'm not sure if your slides are supposed to be going, but they might be paused again. Okay, I was just gonna move it. You good? Sorry. Okay. So um, these are David's slides. Um, and uh, in, the, in the red ovals, and I think I have this right, David, are shell deposits. And much of that shell is Olympia oyster shell. This was 15 to 18 cook pits. And a cook pit would be a meter, meter across, probably a meter and a half across, would be half a meter deep. Um, depression that was uh, dug out and then lined with cobbles. A fire would be lit in that uh, in that um, in that fire pit, and then um, those those rocks would be heated up. After the fire burned, um, the ash would be um, swept out, and then clams or oysters 
um, would be placed in there. And then, and then moist vegetation or kelp would be put on top, things like fern fronds or, or uh, skunk cabbage. And then those clams and oysters would cook on those hot rocks. Um, yielded a, a tremendous number of shells and also fire modified rock. Um, this is uh, one of David's slides about the number of F FMR, so that's fire modified rock by unit. So levels going down by 10 centimeters on the left and then, and then sort of the grid on the top, I believe, um, there across the top. So large numbers of rocks, um, fire modified rocks to line these pits, um, as well as shell. And you can see that shell. Um, I mean, I circled it in that other, but you can see it here, and then also just sort of scattered. Um, uh, this is a this is a cobble that was flaked and fit nicely in the palm of a hand that was uh, used to excavate the pit. Um, so, um, and that was that was then put into the pit as well after. Um, I think probably the most interesting. Thing here is that um, we they did they were able to get some uh, carbon fourteen dates from this site, and um, these were from bark or cascara. One was from an unidentified bark, and another one was from cascara buckthorn. Um, and these put these dated these uh, dates these cook pits to about eleven hundred thousand to eleven hundred years before present, and that's actually before nineteen fifty is the is the um, is the firm date on that. So it actually adds 70 years. So we're talking roughly 1100, 12, you know, somewhere between 1000 and 1200 years ago. Um, folks were spending time at the south end of Squim Bay, harvesting oysters and butter clams and cooking them. Um, it's, uh, it's really kind of amazing to be restoring a species that has not been, uh, you know, for the last probably 50 to 100 years been found in much abundance in this area um, to really uh, re um, to bring that to bring that species back is really awesome. Um, hey, hey, Brandon or Bonnie, I'm getting uh, notifications to admit people. And I don't know, are you guys taking care of that? We are. Okay, great. I will ignore them. Um, Let's see here. Uh, so there were a variety of, of other tools found at the site and other faunal remains. So mammals, for example, um, I skipped over that. But if, if you're more, in, if you're interested in this archaeology, um, David gave a great talk. David Brownell gave a great talk on this, and it's on the library's YouTube channel. Um, so uh, the uh, faunal analysis. So they also found elk and deer and harbor seal and dogfish in these remains. But um, the interesting thing is the Olympia oyster and the butter clams. So um, butter clams and little neck clams are quite well represented in uh, midden deposits. So these are deposits, you know, next to like a, a village site where, um, you know, shellfish were consumed and the shells sort of thrown into a pile. Olympia oyster shell, if you put it in a fire, cook it, consume it, throw, you know, it, it, it kind of, it's really friable after it gets heated and it won't preserve really. It kind of just falls apart. But in these cases, these pits were not used. Um, you know, I think probably a new pit may have been built every couple of years or something. And David, I might be going on a limb, but essentially these deposits were not as disturbed as those over time. In other words, it wasn't like, uh, you know, they were, they were, they remained undisturbed. And so those shells were in good shape or good enough shape. Um, so we could we could derive or David and I think with some help from Gary Wesson and, and another uh, um, I'm not sure who, who did this dig with you, David, but um, was able to um, enumerate Olympia oysters and butter clams. One thing that's interesting about it, enumerating bivalves is you want to match up the valves. You don't want to double count. So you have a certain number of individuals. Right. And they both have two shells. So um, but this is quite amazing to have 40 percent of those shells be Olympia oysters. So this is an important Olympia oyster site. Um, I'll leave you with one other thing that, that David had a whole slide to this, but um, he, uh, you know, it's the picnic site 
And um, the Jamestown family picnics in the summer are uh, like a hundred yards away from this, where we have um, a clam bake that's very similar to this. Um, they use wet newspapers instead of, of skunk cabbage leaves or kelp, but um, it's the same cooking method. And it's, it's kind of amazing that it's, that it's so close still. Um, so next I'm gonna kind of talk about, so the, this was a, a really important resource going back. Um, thousands of years in this area. Um, and um, so getting kind of in the last 100, 170 years since the 1850s, um, Olympia oysters were, were a, a major industry early in the state. So, and this included uh, both natives and um, European American immigrants to the state. And so, especially South Sound, large, uh, large portions of the tidelands were diked. Um, and this industry, um, I think, did quite a good job of sustainably growing oysters from what I've read. Um, other parts of Puget Sound, they were over harvested for sure, particularly there's documentation in Samish Bay and uh, Samish Bay and Gray's Harbor, um, but I wouldn't doubt that Swim Bay and Discovery Bay, you think of a ship coming in, you know, grounding itself during a low tide, loading up the hull with a whole bunch of Olympia oysters and sailing down to San Francisco in, in 1852 and selling them for crazy amounts to, to gold miners coming out of the hills. Um, so some of these beds were really over harvested and, and Again, these are bio, this is a biogenic species. So it's a self, ideally it's a self-sustaining habitat. It's creating its own habitat. And so um, if you strip all the oysters and you leave nothing but a mud flat or nothing underneath it, you, you've taken away the breeding population, but you've also taken away the habitat for any young that are left. Um, and so that can really decline that. Um, and then there's several other things that happen. So uh, sedimentation, uh, this big issue in Squim Bay, we see this, we see a layer of mud. If you dig down in the mud, oftentimes there's a shell hash layer. And that shell hash layer was probably the old top of the inner tidal that wasn't a mud flat. Um, it was a fairly hard substrate that certainly at one time was covered largely in, in Olympia oysters. So, um, so that's discouraging. Um, and, and certainly I think probably Discovery Bay is the same way, but, but that's probably from logging and poor land use practices. Um, and then other places like the Duwamish and places in Seattle is just industrialization filling of tidelands. Um, for the South Sound, the Olympia oyster industry was sort of destroyed when they opened a sulfite paper mill in Shelton in, in 1927. And that sulfite liquor was, uh, the wastewater was to, to discharged directly into Oakland Bay and circulated it around South Sound and pretty much killed off the industry within a couple of years. Um, you know, there were weird algae blooms and, uh, and it just, it made it impossible. Entire beds died. Um, in addition, um, they try early in the night, early in the uh, 1900s, they tried introducing Eastern oyster and that introduced a couple of, of uh, predators, um, a couple of different kinds of drills and flatworms. So that added another stress to the, um, to the population. So, so after the Olympia oyster sort of uh, industry collapsed due to these, these stresses, um, they did bring in the Pacific oyster, which was more resilient against those stresses. Um, and that's what built the, the present day uh, oyster industry in Puget Sound. Um, so where do we stand or where did we stand? Um, you know, late 1900s, so we're talking 1995. It's kind of weird to refer to it that way. Um, uh, they had a, a 1998, there was an Olympia oyster plan. Um, it, it landed a little bit off mark. Um, they did quite a bit of, of outplanting of sort of genetically generic uh, Olympia oysters that, that generally did not establish self-sustaining populations. Um, the 2012 plan to restore the Olympia oyster in Puget Sound or in Washington State by, by Brady Blake and, and Alex Bradbury from Fish and Wildlife, I, 
think did a really good job. I think they worked with Puget Sound Restoration Fund on this. Like I, I know they did. Um, and this realized that you couldn't restore the Olympia without restoring habitat. Um, and it really uh, focused on, uh, on, on trying to, to develop core healthy popu reproducing populations in 19 focus areas. So these are those, those triangles on the map on the, on the right. The historic populations were those on the left. And I gotta just make a note about these historic populations that the Olympia oyster was actually found in, in some sense anywhere in Puget Sound and, and the Georgia Strait where there was habitat. So, so up in the San Juans, there were, there were populations, there were populations up and down Hood Canal, but they might just sort of be uh, kind of along the lower inner tidal and not these large beds that you might find on a large tie flat. Um, this plan uh, worked with uh, using hatcheries, a restoration hatchery by Puget Sound Restoration Fund. An emphasis on preserving genetics. So there's five distinct populations, sub-basin populations of Puget Sound. Um, and again, this idea of kind of getting these core populations self-sustaining and, and large, you know, it's kind of these large self-sustaining populations in these that can then either you can take oysters from there and kind of outplant them in, in areas they might do well, or that those will kind of seed out, those larvae will drift out of that population, but that you don't have a population where you have reproduction and then those larvae drift off and they don't, they don't kind of form that core. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about re restoration in Squim Bay and in Discovery Bay. And uh, restoration in Squim Bay was done in cooperation with the Clown County uh, Marine Resources Committee. Um, and I remember walking around in 2012, I believe it was with Chris Burns, who's, who's up there in the boat and uh, and going, God, there's just not that many Olympias out there. There were some in some areas, but when you walked across the tide flats in Glen, um, there just weren't that many Olympias. And so they actually collected broodstock for the Puget Sound Restoration Fund hatchery. From there, we actually did a, a grow out of families and then use some of those um, um, to produce a large amount of seed, like 500,000 seed for 2013. Um, um, so basically the process here, you can see my cursor. This is the brood stock. Um, those were taken to the hatchery, um, spawned. So they manipulated the water temperature. This is a Pacific shell. That right there is a baby Olympia, yay. Um, these are in bags here, um, loaded them up in a boat. Um, this is Chris Burns, uh, Ralph Riccio and Liz Tobin. Um, and then, um, then we um, brought these down to our initial restoration site, which I'll refer to as site A, which is one and a half acres. Um, and this is Casey Allen, um, cut open the bag and shake out, the, shake out the, the Pacific shell that's covered in baby Olympias over the tide flats. And then, and then what do you get? Um, you get a, a tide flat as the tide goes out, um, tide flat with some shells on it that have lots and lots of baby Olympias on them. Um, so, Upper, upper left is kind of what they look like in 2000. I'm not sure if this is 2013 or 2014, but you can see, this is actually really cool. Um, if you can see my cursor, this is the initial, what they look like, and this is the growth that we got on them. Squim Bay is great for growing shellfish. There's lots of plankton. Um, and so we got really nice growth on these. A few years later, this is, a, this is sort of a small depressed, the, um, sort of uh, wet area that Olympias tend to favor and it's just covered in Olympias. Um, this isn't the entire site. We kind of find that, that you know, er, there's some areas that they did really well that, that stayed a little bit wetter and then other areas where they did less well, um, but very heartening. The other thing we started to notice is by 2015 that they started uh, seeding out across the tidelands. Um, and so we were finding Olympias where we hadn't seen them before and it was it was reproduction from the seed that we had placed out two years previous so um really quick um timeline again so 2013 we placed those 500,000 seed on, on site a which is kind of right in front of the lab this is um we have three areas now the tribal centers here right off the right off the edge 
the idea is to kind of have this arc of Olympia oysters on our tidelands in Lynn. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, in 2015, uh, another hundred bags. So that's about two and a half yards of blank shell were spread out to aid in settling substrate. Again, there's still a lot of mud out there. Um, they need substrate. In 2019, we received money from the Natural Resource Conservation Service and we placed, and I believe the MRC uh, helped fund this as well, uh, 100 cubic yards of blank shell. So that's basically a semi truck load, a um, lot of shell. Um, how do we know if we're doing an okay job besides just kind of going out there and being like, hey, there's Olympia oysters out here? Well, we do population uh, surveys. Um, so methods for monitoring, this is the, uh, this is the site, the acre and a half in red. Um, there's a bit of drift out of this, um, but um, we set up transects. So each one of these yellow dots is a, uh, on this left-hand picture is a, is a sample site. So, you, so a flag is placed out by the, the surveying biologist. And then behind that person comes a team of measurers. So this is uh, Liz Tobin and I think Tim, I can't remember his last name from the MRC. And what Liz is doing is she's measuring all the Olympias in that, in that, um, in that quarter meter uh, quadrat or as Annie likes to call it the science square. I, I love that term. Um, but so, um, so in the end, you know the number and size of Olympias per meter squared uh, in your samples, and you know the size of the plot, and you do a bit of math, and you can calculate a population estimate. And you can do a histogram of the population structure, because you don't want all, especially if you've, you've set out seed, you want to you get recruitment too. You want to get um, baby oysters settling out too. Um, so. Um, how does um, an Olympia oyster population assessment uh, change over time? So this is site A, which is the, the site that we first seeded out in 2013. 2017, you're talking about 35,000 oysters. 2018 seemed to kind of be a much lower year, um, crawled up a little bit. And this is when we placed, actually we placed shell here between 2018, 2019, and then we placed a whole bunch of shell in 2019. And what we see is that's reflected that, that next year because there were more baby oysters recruiting to the population. 2021, it seemed to go down again. Um, hopefully, again, these are the error bars on that on the survey. So um, this is actually all kind of, most of this is within um, margin of error, but um, we'll see what that holds. You may need to add more shell. I think we are planning on adding more shell. Um, we also have those other two restoration areas. I'm just going to show data for site A. Um, so um, this is the histogram for this. Um, the purple line is the age of reproduction, um, I believe. Um, so um, actually, you know what that is? That's probably the first year of um, growth. So you look at recruitment and the top, the top one is 2018. and um, in 2019, you, you don't see a lot of baby oysters. We set out a whole bunch of settlement substrate. That next year, we got a whole bunch of oysters recruiting the population. So they were babies that found a nice spot to land. And hope I, presumably, they landed on all that shell that we put out there. Um, 2021, this, this population structure is a little bit more spread out, um, but we're still getting some recruitment here as well. So that's, that's good. We want to continue to see recruitment. Um, I'm going to talk now about Jefferson County um, Marine Resources Committee, sort of expanding habitat and expanding the population in, in Discovery Bay. Um, Discovery Bay um, in these lagoons opposite the old Snug Harbor restaurant. So there used to be an old sawmill here. And strangely enough, there's just this really, this is the outlet um, channel all the way over on the left. Um, it's kind of what I want all the bay to look like, quite honestly, is it just a biogenic habitat. It's a mixture of, of Olympia oysters and mussels. There's limpets and shore crabs, and, and um, there's even clams mixed in there. There's some algae. It's just this super rich habitat. Um, the middle there is a giant Pacific oyster shell covered in olies. And so again, in Discovery Bay, you don't get a lot of Pacific recruitment, but sometimes you find these big old 
honkin like size 14 shoe size Pacifics, and this one happened to be covered in, in Olympia. So, so in these muddy habitats where you might have a Pacific oyster or two uh, hanging out, uh, they can be actually a really good substrate for, for Olympias. Um, vicinity map, I'm gonna be talking about two locations, one of which is the lagoon site, which is right here, right along 101, and then the power line site, which is out in the middle of the bay, which is that hashed polygon. Um, Historically, this was an area, again, there was a winter village site near here um, that had a very uh, large, um, plentiful strewn bed of Olympia oysters every day. Um, and the MRC has actually worked since 2002 to protect and expand it. Um, but what we found were that baby oysters lacked hard substrate to grow and land on. Um, and it's also one of the 19 populations that Fish and Wildlife targeted for enhancement. So uh, timeline going back, um, 2002, the, the MRC identified this as, a, um, as that lagoon population as kind of being this nice small population. It was monitored um, in partnership with the Puget Sound Restoration Fund and Fish and Wildlife. Um, 2014, uh, Ralph Riccio, who was a shellfish biologist at that time, uh, who, who was on the MRC before I was, um, worked with the MRC, Cheryl Lowe and other volunteers, Gordon King and, and Sus uh, Sarah Fiskin and, and, and probably Frank Handler and Troy. I know that a couple of the MRC members are on, on the call today uh, and I'm probably missing a few people um, to establish a half an acre restoration area at the power lines. The idea here is that it becomes a satellite population. Um, this area, if you walked around it at low tide, you'd find the occasional Olympia settled on like the random clamshell. So it's clear that this area was getting some recruitment. It was getting some larvae that were looking for something to settle down on, but it was a mud flat or, or an eelgrass flat and there wasn't anything for, for the Olympias to settle on. So in 2015, they um, spread about hundred bags of shells. So that's about two and a half yards um, at the power line site in 2016, uh, we added 80 more bags or they added more 80 bags. And then in 17, 18, and 19, or 17 and 18, we uh, showed uh, recruitment and growth. Um, 2019, we, we changed our focus a little bit to the shell, to the lagoon, thinking, you know, we can enhance these areas as well. Um, I actually walked around that area with, with Brady Blake. And we kind of like, I'm, I have like a sketch in a notebook somewhere. I was like, oh, let's put 20 bags of shell here. Let's put 20 bags of shell here. It was very like fine tuned where we might find a seep in between two areas that are super muddy, but there were a few Olympias in there. You know, we thought if we put shell there, the Olympias will come. Um, in 2020 and 2021, we added more shell to the lagoon and spit site. And then um, in 2020, 10 yards of bulk shell uh, were delivered to the power line site by Taylor Shellfish. Um, Gordon King um, donated his time and, uh, and I think gave us an amazingly good deal um, for a crew from Taylor Shellfish to deliver that shell out there. Um, and then last summer, uh, two more yards were delivered uh, to the power lines as well. So, um, so what did we find? Well, um, this is the power line area. This is the original eelgrass, uh, eelgrass survey. Um, one thing I should mention, uh, so the upper left is the, is the um, vicinity map, um, is we are about to hopefully get, uh, ink's not dry yet, but get a right of entry here to place more shell. Um, a lot of our um, Olympios in this core area within the red have actually drifted to the south because the prevailing winds are from the north and northwest in the summer, and they actually move some of the shell out of our restoration area. So, um, so anyway, we're hopefully we, we should be able to, to basically double the size of our restoration area in the coming years. Um, so, um, I haven't normalized the data for the 17 and 18 and 19 surveys, but I just wanted to show kind of uh, again like what shell placement can do. Um, so, uh, so between 2020 and 2021, 
uh, the number of Olympias increased from about 38,000 to 55,000 in our plot in that red area that I showed above. Um, and that was 10 yards of shell were actually added in 2020, about a month before we did our survey. And we actually had, we already started to see baby Olympias settling on that shell. They were super small. They were like a couple of millimeters long, but it was really great to see. Um, and again, this, the histogram, you can kind of see this recruitment of these younger age classes, everything kind of under the, you know, 30 millimeter size range or, or 20 millimeter size range. Whereas up here, you've got, it's sort of a bit flat and then it's this big bump. Um, but this is quite a healthy population that's self-recruiting, which is really quite great. And I'm guessing the two populations, the lagoon population and the power lines population are just one population um, that are, that are, you know, larva are moving well between those two. Um, so the lagoon area is, again, it was a little bit uh, finer tuned. Um, you know, this upper right-hand picture is down along that spit and you can kind of see a couple distinct patches there. And that's where there were seepy areas versus muddy areas. Um, the lagoon there had Olympias that were settling on anything that was hard. And so we decided to give them more stuff like shell to settle on. Um, what's really cool about this is, is we spread the shell in April. And the idea there is that that we typically see spawning in, in, in Olympia oysters by May to June. And, um, and actually in, in Discovery Bay, we see multiple age classes. Um, so we spread the shell in April. And then when we went out in September and October, um, what we found is that shell had a lot of olies on it. And so these were, some of them were almost the size of a quarter. Um, you know, that shell that's the picture on the right is like, right there. I mean, I, I, you know, it was like one of those shells that we were probably throwing out of our hands right there. So this was awesome. Um, some of the shell out on the, on the spit didn't quite do as well, but the shell in the lagoon and the outlet to the lagoon on average had about five young Olympias on it in October. So considering each bag had somewhere on the uh, order of, you know, 200 shells in it. And we spread, I think we spread 120 bags. Um, you know, we provided settlement substrate for thousands and thousands of oysters. It was really cool. Um, so, and, and then some of those, some of those areas now you look at them and you're like, oh yeah, I remember this didn't have many oysters in it. It's a weird place. We can't do a traditional, uh, uh, population survey because you can't run a grid on it. Um, so it's sort of long and skinny habitat and, or you know, this pond that's, that's pictured there is, um, it's kind of, it drains at like a plus three, but it never fully drains. So it'd be very difficult to count the oysters, you could like snorkel maybe and do it. But, um, so, um, again, oh, that upper left-hand picture is actually the, the, uh, Olympias that we saw like a month after setting that shell. Um, and, uh, so the data really indicates that in, in Discovery Bay, because we had this core population, we were able to just enhance the habitat um, to catch more baby oysters that were already there that just didn't have the habitat to land on um, versus having to go through the hatchery, hatchery route. Um, and, um, and I think we're starting to see some of these densities, that lower left, um, is really, you know, starting to get to where you look at it and you go, wow, those are Olympias settling on Olympia shells. And that's going to fill in. I think over time, it's going to be more, more oysters and less mud. Um, and again, that, that habitat is, is this complex three-dimensional habitat. Um, just want to point out, those are some of our great, actually that's Monica Montgomery in the, in the white shirt and, uh, who's our coordinator. And Cheryl Lowe, who is our former coordinator who volunteers for Olympia Oyster uh, Restoration. And then Greg Brotherton, who's the Jefferson County Commissioner who uh, was on the MRC at that time was out there count, uh, counting Olympias in the mud. So um, great project, um, really good volunteer um, effort. Um, and I just wanna state that it's like a community-based project. Uh, both of these are. Um, so, I'm going to talk about a little bit of a, a failure as well, that sometimes things don't go as well. Um, 
So uh, we were hoping to get uh, do a similar project as the power lines or similar actually probably to Squim Bay where we use a seeded culch to, um, to reestablish a population. And, and one of the things we, the tool that we used was test plots. So we didn't want to go out there with hundreds of thousands of baby oysters and have them all die. So we, you know, we got, you know, I think I can't quite remember, but, you know, maybe 20 bags of seeded culch with proper broodstock on it that were then set out in these test plots on the Quilcene Bay Tidelands. And um, these were set on 2016. And by 2019, basically all the oysters were dead. And so we had poor survival. We didn't get really any recruitment. Um, and uh, and we also found, so it was probably dri oyster drills, which typically Pacific oysters preferably, but in this case seem to dine on, on Olympias. Not a lot of them were just dead for unspecified reasons, high temperatures. And there's this heavy mat of potentially invasive macroalgae on these, this plot on the left, for example. So sometimes it just doesn't work. And it's good to test things somewhere before you, um, you invest a lot. Um, that being said, other areas of Quilcene Bay on the, on the sort of southwest and southeast um, we did a survey with Puget Sound Restoration Fund and, and Fish and Wildlife in 2018. Um, by we, I mean Jefferson County MRC, led by Puget Sound Restoration Fund. And we found extensive naturally occurring Olympias kind of in that negative one area. You know, there'd be a big band of Pacifics up high and then integrated with Olympias into the sort of lower, lower intertidal. So there are Olympias in, in uh, Wilson Bay. They just, we don't have this big mud, you know, this big sort of bed formation. Puget Sound Restoration Fund is working with a landowner in the Southeast portion of the bay. Um, and they've got a, a restoration area in there with, uh, with Olympia oysters. So um, the MRC is looking to other areas. We're looking at Killisset Harbor in particular. And then also, um, We've kind of explored a couple of other areas. This was 2020 um, where we were able to kind of get out and do some field work. And it was nice to see people on the MRC, not as a little zoom box. This is uh, Frank Handler and I on the, on the right-hand side and then Heather Burns on the left. And this is, uh, this is actually um, Sarah Fiskin, who's on the MRC, uh, lives down on Daybob Bay. And this is, you know, this, this looks like a giant Pacific bed but as we dug into it and we started lifting up things, we found loads of, of little, I shouldn't say a little, adult Olympias underneath the Pacific bed. So these were co-occurring where, where kind of, especially where the, the beach was a little wetter. Um, I'm not sure how we do a restoration in this or even if we need to, um, but it was kind of good just knowing that they were there because they're easy to overlook. Um, so, um, my overall outlook is positive in terms of the rise again of Olympias. Um, I'll leave you with a big picture of a restoration area um, in uh, Pols near Polsbo. Um, this is this is a, a led by Puget Sound Restoration Fund and the Suquamish Tribe. And this is probably a bed that has like a million oysters in it. And again, they started off with a small population and then just started adding substrate and and um, so, you know, I kind of think about it. I'm about to turn 50 and, uh, and I think about sort of my, you know, legacy on this, on this planet. And one of them wants to be, I'd like them to be is, is, uh, or like it to be, you know, yeah. You know, as I'm like an old guy, like a, you know, really old guy getting out on, on the, the tide flats of Squim Bay or Discovery Bay and going, you know, we kind of return this to how it should be. Um, you know, this iconic creature that, that's fed people for millennia is back. And, um, you know, if I can, you know, I'll, 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 uh, I'll be a happy old guy if I can kind of say that. So um, anyway, I want to acknowledge, and, I, and I'm sure I'm leaving some folks off, but Liz, Liz, Annie, and Ralph, and, and Allie, um, you, you helped me out with the presentation um, here. David Brownell, you totally saved me with that archaeology. It's a really interesting site at um, at the Veterans Memorial Park, the picnic site, um, to kind of tie this all in in terms of the arc of history. Um, 
the folks at Puget Sound Restoration Fund are great. If you want to make a donation to someone, it's a good place to do it. Uh, Fish and Wildlife, um, Brady Blake, uh, you know, it's really cool going out sometimes and, and taking a beach walk and kind of going, let's put some shell here, let's put some shell here. And then five years later go, hey, that worked. Um, so, and then also uh, there, Chris Erdley and uh, Camille Speck have been very uh, supportive. Um, the folks at Jefferson MRC are great. So Monica is the coordinator, but also, uh, you know, some of the folks were also pictured, but Cheryl Lowe and, um, and I'll, I'll, you know, go down the list, but Gordon King, um, Sarah Fiskin, Brent Batapolis, uh, Frank Handler, Heather Burns. Um, so I've been a huge help. Um, and then the Clallam MRC volunteers, I, I don't know them as well. Um, but uh, Tim and uh, some of the others that came out to do population assessments and, and Lynn Minch as well. Um, so anyway, thank you guys. And then um, I can take questions and I'm leaving a couple of, of websites up here um, to help out. So the MRCs, depending on if you're in Clallam or Jefferson counties, or if you're, if you're tuning in from further afield, like, like Island County, um, you know, they also have an MRC. Puget Sound Restoration Fund. And then there's cool, the last one there's Native Olympia Oyster Collaborative out of UC Davis. They have a neat uh, story map that, that spans the West Coast. So you can kind of see what folks are doing like in San Francisco Bay or, or uh, British Columbia. David, I see you have your hand raised. I do. Thanks, thanks for the talk, Neil. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, I've got, I think my question sort of two parts. Your map got me wondering, are there any Olympia oyster populations in Dungeness Bay? And part two of that would be, would it be a, is there potential there for restoration or are there habitat or environmental factors that make it not ideal? That's a great question. And I, and I, I don't know, it's not a documented site. I'd be curious. I've never walked around out there at low tide just looking for them. Um, I think the habitat's probably there. If you can find a, an area that stays moist, um, I don't know why they wouldn't do fine in Dungeness Bay. Um, you know, I think it comes down to, and I think you and I have actually discussed this, that, you know, they're underrepresented in midden deposits. So if if we're looking at that, you know, the village sites there on Dungeness Spit, there's probably midden deposits and up above there, um, you know, I know there's, there's middens that have been excavated that you're not going to see the Olympia shell. You're going to be like, well, they're eating butter clams and little necks. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had the same question. It's like, well, why not Dungeness Bay? And it's, and the other thing I think about is if you're, running a scow down to San Francisco and you want to load up on oysters, the closest spot in Puget Sound would be Dungeness Bay or probably, Port, I mean, and who knows, Port Angeles Bay, but, but they weren't documented as far as I know, which is, is interesting. I, I probably should ask Brady because he's, I think he's read every historical thing, but, um, but I, I don't know why they wouldn't grow there. They grow on the outer coast of British Columbia and all those, you know, Barclay Sound and that type of area too. So it, it's strange that we don't see them in there. All right. Thanks folks.